Hey Light Church, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, glad you guys are here. Uh, it's been a little bit of an interesting week. Last Saturday, I ended up testing positive for COVID. Um, and so thank you, Stevie, for stepping in last minute, last Sunday. Um, and so this was kind of the first time our online service and our in-person service didn't quite match up. Uh, but this week it will. I'm really thankful. My really good friend, Vince Medrano, down at Faith Community Church is going to be sharing today and continuing in our future church series. Uh, so make sure you guys uh, stay tuned for that. It's going to be a really, really powerful word. And by next Sunday, Lord willing, um, I'll get to be back with you guys both online and in person. And thank you guys so much for being here. A couple of things I wanted you to know about as well is we've just launched our follow-up and table. So if you're looking to get connected, build a relationship, that would be a great way to do that. Also, on October 10th, we're going to be having a Welcome to Church lunch. Um, so if you want to go ahead and mark that on your calendar, would love for you guys to be there, especially if you're new to our community. And then lastly, um, if you would like to worship the Lord uh, through giving, uh, one of the ways you guys can be doing that is just going to our website, clicking on the giving tab, and knowing that as we continue to offer the Lord not just our songs and our lives, but even trusting him as our provider not only does it does something beautiful inside of us but god is able to do something really incredible um, through our church and in the community around us so thank you so much for those who've been able to do that let's get our hearts ready as we get to worship the lord this morning
Church, it is so good to be with you here today. I just want to first uh, say how much I love and appreciate your community. I love your heart for Jesus and your desire to see that as you spend time with Jesus, not just personally, but as a community, that you would seek to, uh, to see him transform who you are so that you might better know him and love uh, the people around you. Today we're continuing the sermon series that you have been in called Future Church. Uh, and in this series, you've been looking at uh, different challenges that we're facing in our culture and what an alternative society might look like in Jesus. And as we continue this series uh, today, what we're gonna be looking at is a community of peace in a culture of fear through the practice of silence and solitude. Um, I'm someone that loves nature documentaries, uh, specifically nature documentaries that are narrated by Sir David Attenborough. You really, once you listen to Sir David Attenborough narrate uh, a cheetah running through the Serengeti, you cannot listen to anybody else. Um, the nature documentary that I want to reflect on just for a moment is one that just came out on Apple TV Plus called The Year That the Earth Changed. 
And in this nature documentary, uh, they explore that first moment of shutdown that we all experienced in spring of 2020. If you remember how eerie the streets were and everything just came to a halt. But in this documentary, they explore that impact that it had on nature, on the creatures of this world. And um, there was one point of, of observation um, that just absolutely captured me. It was in Alaska, and they were looking at the, the habits uh, of humpback whales. What we found is in Juneau, Alaska, is that annually 1.3 million people through cruise ships venture in to Juneau, Alaska, and you can imagine the amount of noise that that creates in the waters. Well, all of a sudden, that comes to a screeching halt. And what scientists were able to observe when that noise stopped is that the whales began to communicate with each other in sounds that they have never heard. The observation is like, imagine being, trying to have a conversation with your friend inside of a noisy bar or club, and all of a sudden you're transported into a library. And just like the, the ability now that you're able to hear with one another. The other thing that was observed is that mother whales actually allowed their calves to venture away from them and went off to feed in the, in the rich waters because they knew that they can hear their calves without the absence of noise. Listen, we, we were made to have times of rest, to have times of silence. But I don't know if you, you, you realize this, right? You probably do, is that we live in an increasingly more noisy, active society. Scientists are actually struggling to find uh, points in the world that is not impacted by human noise. That actually, in even the most remote areas of the world, that if you sit there long enough, you will hear the flight pattern of a plane overhead. It's getting increasingly more and more difficult to step away from the noise of our world. But it isn't just the sounds of humanity, our planes, our boats, our generators. It's all of the noise around us that seeks to capture our attention and imaginations. Billboards, news reports, Twitter threads, games on our phones, TVs, and now even our car dashboards are filled with access to the world around us. And here's the challenge, is that studies tell us the more time we spend on things like social media, the more anxious we become, the more depressed we are, and even the more meaner we become. Because one of the troubling things that's happening is that we're constantly receiving information and never enough time to process through it. We're on sensory overload. When I think about that, I think about my five-year-old boy, Tiago. He gets so captured in the world of television. And he gets so captured and enthralled with it that all he gets, he, he begins to be in a place of sensory overload. He becomes overwhelmed by what's on the screen. And just not too long ago, we were watching, of all things, the Great British Baking Show. And as we're watching this, he suddenly sleeps up from the floor and shouts to us, I'm scared! <laughs> he was terrified at the thought that someone's patisserie might come out of the oven not fully cooked. Because as he's captured in the world and the noise of television, his, his, his overactive imagination just runs wild with all of the possibilities, all of the things that might take place. And for him, a cake sitting on a counter, just his imagination starts running wild of everything that might happen to that beautiful cake that's on display. See, all of the noise around us has us hyper aware. 
We're overstimulated and lack the ability to work through the, everything that is being stirred within us. And through our overabundant access to what's happening in our world, we're taking in so much information. And what's happening is that information that we're taking in is speaking to all of the really important areas of our hearts and our imaginations. It's speaking to our places of comfort, our places of security. It's speaking to our future. It's speaking to our relationship. And what's found is that all of this noise, it's stirring us up. It's agitating us. It's producing anxiety and fear within us. We're afraid that we don't have enough. We're afraid that we don't, that we aren't enough. We're told to be afraid for the future and the present of our nation. We're told to be afraid for future generations. We're told to be afraid. We're informed to be afraid of such and such people group. And every day, multiple times a day, we're being called on our phones and being told to be afraid that our car warranty is about to expire. But there also exists within us noises that we don't know how to sit with. And what we end up doing is trying to treat our places of fear and anxiousness with more noise. We drown out our deep internal life because we're afraid to explore what just might be happening within us. I love the way that Henry Nouwen says it. He says it this way, as long as our minds, heart, and hands are occupied, we can avoid confronting the painful questions to which we never gave much attention and that we do not want to surface. So the question for me becomes, where do we go from here? How does the goodness and faithfulness of God lead us in this ever-present noise, in that fear and anxiousness that so often occupies not only us, but the world around us. Let's look to scripture. I wanna specifically take us to Mark chapter four. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation, but as before we go in there, I want you to just, just sit with me for a moment. As we, as we get our minds around what's happening in this story. The same story is told from multiple vantage points in scripture. We see this same story in Matthew chapter 8, Mark chapter 4, and Luke chapter 8. And what we discover is that it has been days filled with crowds. Jesus was surrounded by people. He healed, he taught, he ministered, he, he, he freed people from demonic oppression. And as more and more crowds were pressing up against him, the noise around him intensifying every single day, Jesus gives instruction to his disciples. We read it again in Mark chapter 4. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence! Be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. It's night. 
This in and of itself wasn't alarming for this crew. A boat was a normal form of transportation for them. And even for a collection in this group, the boat was their office. It was their place. It was a vocation and work. So we have to imagine that, that little raindrops falling on them wouldn't stir up anxiousness or fear. The little small rocking of waves wouldn't be overwhelming for them. But what they're facing this night was something entirely different. For seasoned sailors to be overcome with fear must mean that this storm is stunning in its power and its authority. But if you look close enough, you can see Jesus with me here. Do you see him? Do you see him in the boat? He's exhausted. And that might feel odd to admit. He's asleep because he's tired. He's exerted so much energy ministering, serving, healing, teaching, having crowds constantly being pressed up against him. And amidst all of that noise, we find a lesson for us. Jesus rested. He slept really well. And can I tell you, as I get older, that in and of itself is an incredible miracle. How much we cry out for the ability to have the calm with all of the noise and chaos in the world around us. We want this place of stability that we see in Jesus. In our place of abundant information, life worries, terrible news, devastating sorrow, growing relational tension, we long to be a people who are able to be at peace, like what we see in Jesus here. He was at rest while there was absolute chaos around him. Do you see it? Do you see the boat tilting, swaying, being thrown back and forth? Do you see the waves invading the interior of the boat? And sit with me here in the wonder of it. How can someone be at such peace in a place like this? Water starting to pool around his, his legs. Waves slamming on his face, his body jostled back and forth, growing, grown men screaming near his face into his ears, crying out for help. Yet Jesus remains unchanged by the storm around him. The storm, no matter how fierce, will not inflict control upon Jesus. This storm has absolutely no authority on him, which is absolutely wild, but here we get a glimpse of the immutability of God. The things that are over our head, they're under his feet. He's not rattled. He's not alarmed. Here he is with perfect peace. You see, because for the Jewish imagination, the sea was the place of chaos and danger. If you go back to the very page, first pages of scripture, what you'll notice and what you'll read there is that, that the earth was formless and darkness covered the deep waters and the spirit of God hovered above the waters. The waters in the Jewish imagination personified the place of darkness and chaos. It was a place that was uninhabitable and was unwelcoming of life. All of this to say, Genesis 1 shows us that God hovers even over our worst nightmares. That which we want to avoid, that which we don't want to come to the surface, that which we try to distract ourselves with with more and more noise. 
God exerts control and authority over. And now in Mark chapter four, Jesus is doing the same thing that he did in the creation narrative. He is showing his power and his authority over what is most chaotic to us. What is most scary for us to confront or to sit with? That which provokes the most fear within us. The places we hesitate to step into and are terrified to be alone with. God is not shaken. But the exchange here in the boat is crucial to zoom in on between the disciples and Jesus. They cry out to him. A, a cry that we've probably all prayed and shouted out to the heavens. Jesus... Don't you care? Are you sleeping because you're indifferent to our suffering? We're afraid, Jesus, but your eyes seem to be closed. And at first glance, Jesus' response can be unsettling for us. Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? See, in our, in our ears, this sounds like a really bad response by Jesus, doesn't it? Because there are those of us that are, that are here right now that have been made to feel like our suffering is because we didn't have enough faith. You are the way you are because you don't have enough faith. You're going through the storm that you are because you don't have enough faith. If you just had more faith, you wouldn't be dealing with this disease. We're afraid to get away from the noise of life because we think there we might discover a God who is angry with us. And we don't want to be alone with that God. But can I encourage us today to get that nonsense out of our minds? Because that's not what's happening here in Jesus' statement to the disciples. Because, I would, listen, please, 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 please notice that even with their lack of faith, Jesus still calms the storm. They didn't have enough faith, and he still cared for them. Their lack of faith didn't equate to less care or love from Jesus. Just like the storm doesn't rattle Jesus, our lack of faith doesn't rattle his love for us. But what we see is that he desires for his disciples to grow in their understanding and trust in him. In Jesus' eyes, it is problematic that his dearest friends misunderstand him. What we can't get around in this passage is that Jesus desired for his disciples to be further along in their knowledge of who he is. It concerned Jesus that they thought the wind and the waves were stronger than him. But that doesn't cause him to love them any less or to pull away from them. If anything, we see Jesus stepping closer to them because what he seeks to develop in them is more trust in him. I don't want you to be overwhelmed in the storm. I don't want you to be overwhelmed in all of the noise that's happening in the world around you. I want you to see that the elements don't have more power than me. See, it's, it's this place of realizing that God desires that you would have peace. And that may be a conception of God that needs healing in our hearts and minds. Listen, he is the most joy-filled, delighted, and peaceful being anywhere. And he wants you to, to be able to know that and live with a growing ability to share the joy and the delight and the peace that exists within him. What he desires for us is rest. Instead of, instead of stress, calm instead of chaos, assurance instead of anxiousness, reconciliation and relationships instead of hostility. 
Do you, do you hear the call of Jesus? When he, when, he, when he says this to all of humanity, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Like those humpback whales in Juneau, Alaska, you were made for rest. You were made to experience peace and joy. But there's a step of courage that we need to take today, even today, to be able to come before the Lord with complete honesty, transparency, and vulnerability to come before his presence. And we, like I mentioned on the front end in this sermon series that you've been in, there's been an accompanying practice. And right now what I want to do is transition us to a place where we might know about this practice, this historic church practice called silence and solitude. This, this isn't just getting me time in the day. But I love how Pastor Dave Lomas in San Francisco describes it. Silence and solitude is creating the emotional and spiritual space which allows Christ to build in us an inner sanctuary where we can commune with God, unite with God's will, and enjoy his presence. The words of the practice in and of, them, in and of itself described it really well. What we seek is silence and solitude. We want to find a time where the noise of life is hushed. And when we say solitude, what we mean is a place where it's just Jesus and me, wholly consumed in his presence. We seek to find a prolonged period of time in our daily rhythms to be alone with God, to be silent before him. And initially, listen, that may sound wonderful to us right now. You say, oh, easy. This is incredible practice and easy, to, absolutely easy just to step into in our day-to-day -day living. But we often avoid it. And the reason that we avoid it is because if we know that if the noise stops, then we'll be left to face that which we've been trying to drown out. If we're honest, a lot of times in life we would rather have the noise we would rather have the distractions. We would rather have just Netflix constantly playing rather than sit with the noise that is raging inside of us. We're afraid of silence and solitude because it's where we relinquish all control. Because it's not the place for us to speak. It's the place for us to listen. To be silent before God and hear what he has to say. And that can terrify us because we think that he might bring up all of the things that we are trying to drown out. But that's why I wanted to spend time with Jesus and the disciples because the answer to the question that they shouted into his face is yes. He does care. He does care for us. He does care for the storm that we find ourselves in. And so to encourage us to step in to this practice this week of silence and solitude, to be enveloped and overwhelmed in, in the incredible, caring, loving, good, presence of Jesus. I love the way that, that it's been, silence and solitude has been described. Let me give you the definition or one of the reflections of silence here. The practice of silence is the radical reversal of our cultural tendencies. Silence is bringing ourselves to a point of relinquishing to God our control of our relationships. Silence is a reversal of the whole possessing, controlling, grasping dynamic of trying to maintain control of our own existence. Silence is the inner act of letting go. Solitude is not private therape a private therapeutic place. 
Rather, it is the place of conversion, the place where the old self dies and the new self is born, the place where the emergence of the new man or the new woman occurs. Solitude is the furnace of transformation. Without solitude, we remain victims of our society and continue to be entangled in the illusion of the false self. Solitude is the place of the great struggle and the great encounter. The struggle against the compulsions of the false self and the encounter with the loving God who offers himself as the substance of the new self. That's Henry Nouwen that gives us that incredible description. It's been said that at the age of 35, men must make a decision. Either really get into World War II history are really into smoking various meats. I've chosen the latter. Smoking meat is my all-time favorite hobby. Oh, just last week, I smoked this rib eye roast and it was incredible. (laughs) Five hours inside of my Traeger and man, dinner was so, so good. Because what we seek to do is to get a flavor that cannot be shortcut. For that meat to sit constantly for a long period of time to where flavor begins to penetrate deep, deep into that cut of meat. See, silence and solitude is is a place that we won't see just immediate transformation but it is the place where we long to just sit in the presence of Jesus. And for for there, as we sit in the presence of Jesus, to see his transformative work in our lives. I think the majority of us are here because we desire to see deep spiritual transformation. We desire to know Jesus and have him change our lives that we might look more and more like him. But this is a slow process, a process where we find regular time to be saturated in Jesus's love and presence. So let's move to a really practical place for the rest of our time here together. Um, I, because I want this to be something that we, we attempt this week, that we try to put in, into practice. And it may be a great place uh, for you to continue to get into those open table groups um, because then this is a place where you can live this out and reflect on it with with your community. Um, So as we think about this, as we think about stepping into silence and solitude, there are three movements that I, I would hope that you would embrace. The first is to stop. And this might be the hardest step for us to find a a regular time in our day to stop, to be still, to discover that our doing needs to be filled and fueled with our being with Jesus. But we recognize it it might take a long time for for us to actually stop you think about it this way, maybe the analogy we can use in our mind is that there's a difference between how much space a, a smart car needs to stop versus a semi-truck, the distance that it needs to slow down. So many of our minds are moving and have been filled with so much noise that we're like that semi-truck. And when we initially just take time to be in silent, to be silent and to step into solitude, is that what we find is that it's going to be a long onboarding process for us. That when we stop and are finally find a, a space to be still, what we also might discover is that all of these to-do lists might just find just fill our minds. Oh, I've never drained my water heater. Ah, I didn't call my friend Benji back. Oh, I need to go to the dentist. Again, it's just a really practical thing that I have learned to do to help me to stop is that I just have a little piece of paper with me. And then I just write down all of those thoughts that come to my mind. And then I say, silencio, Bruno. I will deal with you later. I am spending time with Jesus right now. 
And if your mind can't stop, then I would encourage you to begin to occupy it with something else. There is a historic church practice called breath prayer. And it's, and it's really simple. What followers of Christ, followers of Christ have done for, for hundreds of years, if not thousands, is, is to find two lines that help, them to fo- help us to focus on Jesus. And then in our inhaling, we say one of those lines, and in our exhaling, we say another line. One of the most common one is what's called the, the prayer of Jesus or Jesus' prayer, and it's this. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And we would just breathe that in. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So when we stop, or we're having a hard time stopping, our breathing helps us to focus in on Jesus and to be with him. One of the ones that I often breathe in and breathe out is just simply this. Let your grace and peace Consume me. Let your grace and peace consume me. Another one that I've come across is just simply this. True vine and gardener, I abide in you. So when you attempt to step into silence and solitude and you just find that it's so difficult to stop, that breath prayer may be a great assistant to you to be able to step into this practice. The second one is this. So the first one was stop. The second is surrender. For us to yield to him. I love what Pete Scazzaro says. He says it this way. Let's face it. We all want a spiritual life, but we prefer to be in charge of it and have it unfold according to our schedule. But following Jesus is not first doing things for him. It is first listening to him speak and doing what he says. Maybe to help us in this place of surrendering to him, the breath prayer that we might come to, uh, to, to bring before him is, Lord, speak, your servant is listening. Because again, this place of silence and solitude is all about stepping into a place where we're saying, God, this moment is a, isn't about me coming to you and telling you all the things that I want you to hear. But I want to take on this posture where I stop and I'm able to hear your leading, your affection, your care spoken over me. That what I want to see take place is like you've taught us to pray, Jesus, your kingdom come, your will be done. Here on earth, this patch of soil, just as it is in heaven. And then the third movement that I would encourage us to remember is submerge. Listen, we are so consumed with doing and accomplishing in our society that we're tempted to believe that the ultimate goal of prayer is accomplishing. Right? We we, we think, we, we pray because it works because it accomplishes something. And the the slight adjustment that I would hope happens for us this week is that we would realize that first and foremost, prayer is about fully stepping in to the loving presence of God. To realize that when we stop and surrender, we have yet to accomplish anything. And even in that space, we discover that God is absolutely delighted in us. So stop, surrender, and submerge. Dive in, sit, and soak in the loving, faithful, good presence of Jesus. And my encouragement to you is start with five minutes. And the next day, see if you can get to six minutes. And then see if you can get to seven minutes. And soon enough, you might be able to sit in silence and solitude for 10 minutes in your morning. 10 minutes in your morning. To be there, present with him. And then as all of that noise comes before him, 
that you would hear him say, I care for you, I love you, and I want to bring a stability, even amidst the most chaotic storms for you, if they're happening around you. This is what C.S. Lewis says. He says, this is my endlessly recurrent temptation to go down to that sea. I think St. John of the Cross called God a sea. And there, neither dive, nor swim, nor float, but only dabble and splash. Careful not to get out of my depth and holding on to the lifeline which connects me with my things temporal. Friends, don't just stop at the shore of God's love but be aided this week by the practice of silence and solitude to be submerged in the ocean that is God. And my hope for you this week is to find a little bit of time in prayer to be alone and to be present with Jesus. Again, start small if you need to. I, I just recently heard someone say it this way. It's okay after a short period of time with Jesus to turn to him and say, that is all that I can handle of the abundance of who you are right now. And I think that he will be okay with that prayer to recognize that he's a lot. <laughs> the, the disciples at the end of the story that we spent some time with were terrified by the power and the glory that they saw displayed in Jesus. And part of coming to know him is sometimes to be overwhelmed by just how much he isn't like us, his, his, his nature, his goodness, his mercy, his grace can be overwhelming for us sometimes. But venture in, venture in, because I hope that we just don't dabble and splash at the shore, but we float in all that God is. Love you, church. It's so good to be with you. And if I can, what we do in, in our community down at Faith, Faith Community Church is end our times together by speaking a blessing over the community. So like church, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Love you.
So thankful that Vince was able to just teach this week um, and just want to encourage you as we talk about being a community of peace in a culture of fear uh, that we would really spend some significant time this week uh, just kind of leaning into those practices whether it's silence and solitude or prayer of allowing our soul not to be tossed this way and that way through the current of our circumstances and things around us so that we'd anchor ourselves to Jesus who his presence is what gives us peace. And I'm just gonna go ahead and pray for us that we would be able to experience the fruit of what Jesus comes to bring. Lord, we thank you so much that you give perfect peace, Lord Jesus. Now, God, we don't need to be anxious about anything, Lord Jesus. God, I pray that you would guard, guard our hearts and our minds, Lord Jesus. And God, I pray that not only as as a community, but the individuals that make up this community would be able to experience a supernatural um, sense of your peace this week, Lord. And God, we just pray against any spirit of fear or anxiety that would just be harassing. God, the people who are watching this, in the powerful name of Jesus, Lord God, that you would just create um, just protection, Lord God. And that you would again just allow us to fix our eyes and our hearts on you, Lord, in Jesus' name.